Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Virtually Speaking series. Tonight, we're going to hear from our legendary former head, Peter Winter, who will share with us a fascinating and very personal insight into his love of France, its language and literature, and in particular, how the culture has influenced his life and values. Peter has been really hugely influential in Latimer life, first as a French teacher in the early 1970s, and later, from 2002, as our head. Peter also coached Latimerians in that not very French sport, cricket, unless it was perhaps French cricket being played up at Wood Lane. <laughs> Those of you who watched our current head, David Goodhue's virtually speaking talk on the history of Latimer through 10 people, you'll know Peter made the cut in David's top 10, coming in at number nine, for in particular overseeing the introduction of full co-education at Latimer and also for creating the development office with the ambition to fund more bursaries. Peter handed the baton to David, and today we're proud to be educating 230 children across the school who are on means-tested bursaries. Before we hear from Peter, I wanted very briefly to tell you a little bit about the Virtually Speaking series. We launched this programme of online talks over the summer as a way of bringing the community together in the absence of our usual social events. And it has really taken off. The series is such an impressive showcase of our community, teachers, alumni and parents, all giving talks of a really high caliber. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to take a look at the full virtually speaking collection on our website where the whole series is available. Of course, these events also help us raise funds for our bursaries program. And I wanted to thank both our speakers, without whom this series would not have been possible, and you, the audience, for supporting the talks. Many of you kindly made a donation when registering for this evening, which has raised £550 for this year's annual bursaries appeal, which is just fantastic. Thank you. And finally, a couple of house rules for this evening's talk. Everyone will be on mute so that we can all hear the presentation clearly. No heckling, please. Do feel, please feel free to type questions in the chat facility so that Peter can review and answer as many as time allows at the end of his talk. So it just remains for me to welcome Peter for his presentation, France and the French, My Personal Journey. Over to you, Peter. Thank you for joining me tonight, everyone. It's a pleasure to be in touch with so many old friends, former pupils, parents and colleagues, and the wider Latimer diaspora. A lot of very familiar and friendly faces in front of me as I speak. For those of you who sensibly have prepared an anaesthetic to help you through the next hour, one like this, um, it would be churlish of me not to salute you. So cheers. Mm, nice little long dot wine. My talk, like Caesar's Gaul, is divided into three parts. I shall begin by talking about some key individuals who inspired my lifelong interest in France. I shall then comment on aspects of the French language which interest me, and I'll conclude by talking about French literature, identifying three writers who have influenced me in particular and who've contributed to my sentimental education. The old cliché that the English love France but loathe the French has more than a grain of truth in it, even now nearly a thousand years since the Norman invasion and occupation of England. We are historic rivals and we each cherish our national myths. The English remember Agincourt and Cressy, Trafalgar and Waterloo. 200 years ago, mothers used to frighten their babies by telling them that Boney would come to get them if they didn't go to sleep. More recently, in our lifetime, it's been up yours, Delors, and now Brexit and all that goes with it. The French, of course, have a rather different perspective. They remember different battles of which we hear little because we lost them. Castillon, the Siege of Orleans, Yorktown and Chesapeake. And of course, we burned Joan of Arc, perfidious Albion. That sweet enemy, France. Sir Philip Sidney's famous phrase in his 1581 poem captures the ambivalent relationship between England and France over the centuries. The Duke of Wellington, however, was rather more forthright when he declared, we have been, we are, and I trust we always will be detested by the French. 
Although just a narrow strip of water separates us, the French are in so many ways extraordinarily different from us. They think differently, they see the world differently, they educate their children differently, their legal and political systems different. And these differences and the many similarities have been a source of lifelong fascination to me. I love their language and literature, admire their culture, their gastronomy and wine, their flamboyant architecture, their sense of style, and their cynical humour. I'm enchanted by the spectacular diversity of their country and time and again over the years I have been met by extraordinary generosity and kindness from French people. Unsurprisingly then my long association with France and the French has formed a major part of my education which explains my habit of alluding to France and quoting in French a quality much satirised by my former colleagues at Latimer. So how was it that a boy from Thornton Heath, a Londoner and Chelsea fan at heart, became a Francophile owning a house down the Longue Dock and spending three months a year there? I should first pay tribute to my parents, both for their unflagging support and for encouraging me to take an interest in the world. My father left school at 16 but was interested enough in languages to attend evening classes in French and German. He had no formal qualifications beyond the school certificate, which significantly hampered his career, so he was very keen for me to go to university. I inherited his interest in history, his rather wacky sense of humour, and his delight in the incongruous. I can see him now chuckling as he recounted an incident which occurred at the Battle of Fontenoy in Belgium in 1745. Time for slide one. The Garde Française. Oh, hang on a minute, I've lost my text. Uh, slight pause. Uh, how do I do this? That one? Right, I'm back with you. The Garde Française found themselves facing the English foot guards at this battle, and the French commander, the Comte d'Anteroche, stepped forward and declared, Messieurs les Anglais, tirez les premiers. Or, Gentlemen, dear English gentlemen, please shoot first. Is this an example of exquisite French politesse or a deliberate provocation? The side that held its fire and its nerve could close on the enemy while it was reloading and fire a more deadly volley. Anglo-French relations are riddled with such ambiguities. I was fortunate to win an 11 plus 3 place at Trinity School in Croydon, a direct grant school very similar to Latimer Upper. There I experienced a range of teachers, some brilliant, some less so, but my languages teachers were inspirational. As a result, I studied French, German and Latin at A-level, very narrow from a contemporary perspective, but I was blissfully happy. The teacher who particularly caught my imagination was a Mr. Wright. He seemed to me to speak perfectly accented French, a rare thing amongst even French teachers, as the English have difficulty with pure French vowels, i and u, rather like the French difficulty with the th, z. I was struck with admiration, and I determined to learn to speak French so well that I could be mistaken for a native speaker. He and another teacher, Mr. Dummer, also inspired in me a love of linguistic precision and a fascination with the detail of language. Mr. Wright was a dapper, quietly spoken man who never raised his voice, a technique I tried to copy when a teacher. A class will tend to strain to listen to a softly spoken teacher, unlike one who raises his voice to speak above the chatter, which then of course becomes louder. In Mr. Wright's class, you could hear a pin drop. He was actually pretty scary. The dread moment in his classes would be when he suddenly stopped talking, followed by a heavy silence, and the dread words, winter, see me at the end of the lesson. A dagger to my heart. All right, as I came to know him in the sixth form, was such an influence on me that I even copied his signature as we share the same initials. But there are two reasons why I am indebted to him. He knew the Charente region around Angoulême well. Charente is in the west of France, in the map you can see Poitou Charente, the peach colored area, center west of France. At the age of 16, 
I stayed for three weeks with a French family in a small town called Ruelle-sur-Touvre, uh, a town where cannons were historically forged for the French Navy at Toulon, and where more recently, I'm afraid, Exocet missiles were made. It was a decisive moment in my life, and I returned to stay with the Gervais family off and on for some 40 years, first on my own, in due course, taking Adjura and the children with me. Mr. Wright also sparked my interest in French writers. He used an ITV program called Ici la France, and here I hold up a visual aid. Here is the booklet, the actual booklet, autumn term 1966, with my name written atop, P. Winter, here it is, six modern la. Uh, he used this as a teaching resource. It was really quite innovative. It presented the regions of France through their writers. So Normandy, for example, was home to Corneille and Flaubert, the Loire Valley to Balzac and Rabelais and so on. Here's a rather magnificent uh, picture of Guy de Maupassant, for example. Ever since then, I've been interested in the association of people and place, and that's expressed itself in a taste for literary pilgrimage in France. In our early married life, our default holiday was meandering through France, using writers and their writing as points of reference. So, for example, I've stood next to the statue of Victor Hugo on the Seine, north of Paris, by the village of Villequier, as he looks mournfully head-bowed out to the Point Mid-River, where his beloved daughter Leopoldine drowned, her boat capsized by the Mascaré, a tidal wave over a metre high like the Seven Boar. No longer exists, they dredge Le Havre Harbour and it's gone. In Paris, I've stood on the Pont Mirabeau, just downstream from the Eiffel Tower, and recited uh, Apollinaire's great lyric poem, Le Pont Mirabeau. And I quote one rather beautiful line. I quote it really for its musicality. I'll try and render it for you. Comme la vie est lente, how slow life is. Et comme l'espérance est violente, and how violent are our hopes. So vie est lente and violente, rather beautiful. Again in Paris, I've stood at the edge of the Père Lachaise Cemetery and looked out over the sprawling city, like Balzac's hero Rastignac at the end of his novel, uh, at the end of his novel Le Père Goriot, a kind of French King Lear, when, having learnt the bitter reality of how to succeed in the social jungle that is Paris, he throws out a defiant challenge to the city. A nous deux maintenant, it's you or me now. In passing, I should say that Oscar Wilde, among many other luminaries, is buried in the same cemetery. It's alleged that on his deathbed, gazing at the wallpaper on the ceiling, so typical of Paris hotels, his final words were, either that wallpaper goes or I do. I visited the little village of Ry, R.Y., in deepest Normandy, on which Flaubert based the fictional village of Yonville, where the events in his great novel Madame Bouvary unfold. And I've sat on a cafe terrace in the heart of Pizanas in the Languedoc, deep south, and watched an al fresco performance of Laval, the miser, a Molière comedy. Molière himself performed there over a number of years while touring the provinces as a young actor writer before he was set up in Paris by a patron. And I've seen the armchair kept in the Comédie Française in Paris, in which he was overcome by a coughing fit, spitting blood, during the fourth performance of his play. Le Malade Imaginaire in 1674. Moliere was playing Argon, the hypochondriac or imaginary invalid. He died later that evening. I like to think he would have appreciated the irony. I could go on, but my pilgrimages came to an abrupt end when our children started to protest. Dad, can't we go somewhere interesting? I heard. So it was Florida and Disney World the next year. But let me return to my family in Charente, Easter 1967, and pay tribute to Raymond Gervais, who was like a second father to me. I cannot count the hours I spent chatting and listening to him at table over a, a glass of Pinot, a Charente speciality, or red wine, or playing boule. Raymond was proud to have qualified at the age of 15 as the youngest chef in the French Navy, and in 1945, on the battleship Jean Bart, he served dinner to François Mitterrand and Ho Chi Minh off the coast of Japan. Great story. 
In July and August, he and his wife Jacqueline would leave their little house in Ruel to camp on what they called their terrain, their plot of land, which they owned just north of Angoulême, beside the lazy river Charente. Here they would live the simple life, close to nature, Raymond fishing, both of them preparing delicious meals twice a day, at which we were joined by an ever-changing cast of friends and acquaintances, mostly working men, garage mechanics, painters and decorators, farm workers, and so on. I learned so much from Raymond. He was the first to challenge my Anglo-centric view of the world. He did not, for example, regard Dunkirk as an unrelieved triumph, and as a former sailor, he spoke with feeling about the sinking of the French fleet by the British at Mercel Kébir in 1940, which Churchill reluctantly ordered to prevent their capital ships from falling into the hands of the Germans. Some 1,300 French sailors were killed in that action. He spoke eloquently about the folly of war, and he took me to Oradour sur Glane near Limoges in the centre of France, scene of the worst atrocity committed on French soil during the Second War, when a whole village was wiped out. In general, he spoke without rancour about the Germans, although whenever he finished a particularly good bottle of wine, he was in the habit of saying, mischievously, encore une que les boches n'auront pas, which one might translate as that's another one the Krauts won't get their hands on. They had the reputation of going after the best bottles they could find. My stays in Ruel were when I learned to speak French with some fluency. A year abroad was discouraged during my time at Oxford. So when I left in 1972, I was pretty widely read in French literature from the Middle Ages up to the mid 20th century. I could quote from Racine and Flaubert. I was a dab hand at textual exegesis, but I didn't know the French for toothpaste or toilet paper. Latimer Upper School, where I took up my first teaching post in 1973 and learned my trade, was another formative period for my French. I was fortunate enough to spend five successive Easter holidays in Paris, three weeks at a time, with Jeff Tate, a fellow teacher of French, who became a lifelong friend. Jeff ran the French exchange with the Lycée Marcelin Berthelot in Paris. This, of course, was in the days before health and safety was invented. Every year, the two of us would take some 60, 14 and 15 year old boys over to Paris by train and ferry. The boys stayed with families. Jeff and I stayed at the one star Hotel du Roule in central Paris. We were on hand to, to deal with any problems such as homesickness, which arose and to accompany the boys on a few excursions. Also with us, was our French assistant, Jean Drillon, one of the great Latimer characters. Jean had toured Canada with a backing group for Edith Piaf. With his trademark Gauloise drooping from the corner of his mouth, ash falling off it, Jean was entertaining company and he enjoyed showing me around the nooks and crannies of Paris. He seemed to know every bar in the city, so we needed to keep an eye on him too. But we had plenty of free time, and those were blissful days. Jeff and I would walk the streets of Paris, idly considering where we might have lunch, and then subsequently dinner, all the while trying to catch each other out on obscure items of vocabulary or points of grammar. I'm also grateful to Morris Isaac, the headmaster who appointed me to Latimer in 1973, for allowing me to take part in a teaching exchange program in the spring of 1978. So I spent three months teaching English to largely unmotivated adolescents in the small town of La Mure, just south of Grenoble in the Alps, an unexceptional town whose claim to fame was to have the deepest anthracite mine in France. Enough said. I didn't take to the narrowly academic nature of teaching in France, I have to say, preferring the more all-round contribution to school life expected of Latimer teachers, but La Mure was happily close to several ski resorts. So much for formative influences. Let me now outline a few aspects of the French language which interest me. France as we know it today has existed since 1918 when Alsace and Lorraine, the eastern provinces of bordering Germany, were returned to France at the end of the First World War. 
its linguistic heritage is fascinating. Back in 1661, before he wrote the plays that are seen as the purest expression of classical French, Jean Racine travelled south from Paris to his uncle in Uzès, near Nîmes, deep in the south. He wrote to his friend La Fontaine that by the time he reached Lyon, the local language was already becoming incomprehensible. He had, for example, asked the maid for a chamber pot, and she handed him a warming pan. When he got to Uzès, it was even worse, he wrote, saying he needed an interpreter as much as if he'd been in Moscow. In 1780, just before the revolution, a traveller would still have found it difficult to understand and be understood in many areas of France. By then, only 11% of the population actually understood the French language. In Brittany, Alsace, Provence, the Languedoc and many other local areas, people spoke their own dialect or patois. Revolutionary France, aware that a nation could not be built unless acute communication was clear across the country and education standard, sought to organise and regularise. The system of département was introduced with each local capital supposedly within a day's horse ride of anywhere in the department. But even in 1880, not that long ago, only just over one-fifth of the total population of France felt comfortable speaking French. In some parts, prefects, doctors, priests and policemen were like colonial officials, baffled by the natives and forced to use interpreters. France was literally a Tower of Babel with a profound cultural division between North and South, which remains marked to this day. Local loyalties remain strong and a significant number of people continue to speak in their patois. Modern French has evolved a long way from the language spoken by Astérix and Obélix and their fellow Gauls, although some 60 words still survive and for any nerds amongst you they among them is the word charrue which is a plow alouette is a lark and the last one a test for those of you who like obscure vocabulary chanson is a weevil they obviously had problems with those a long time ago when the romans occupied gaul in the first century bc they brought with them their own language but this was not the language of cicero but vulgar Latin, so-called, the vernacular language of the legionaries. And this language, this spoken language, remains the bedrock of modern French. An example, for example, the word for head in French, tête, comes from testa, which was a vulgar Latin word, literally for a roof tile, but slang for nut or bons. Caput, the, uh, the word for head, which I'll come to later, actually uh, it gives the um, figurative word for head, chief, uh, but not the physical word for head. Happily, the Romans also planted their vines. Narbonne on the Mediterranean coast was an important city of empire, and the Languedoc is to this day the largest area in the world, I think, planted to vines. Its historic reputation is for producing copious quantities of ploc, pinard or piquette as the French call it, with the average local consuming between two and three litres of it a day. The Poilu, the French infantryman, drank a shot of this before they went over the top of Verdun. It's all changed the last 30 years, however. These days, wine production is much smaller, uh, but of much higher quality, and cirrhosis of the liver no longer kills so many French people. Since the Roman occupation, the language of what is now France has undergone many different influences. As the Roman Empire crumbled, I think in the 5th century AD, Germanic tribes erupted westward, adopting and transforming the local language with their guttural pronunciation in a process called palatalization. And this refers to the position of the tongue in the palate when you pronounce the word. So my top example here, caput, which is the word for head in Latin, the tongue is just here at the bottom of the palate, but over time, and I mean over centuries, could becomes sh, uh, where the tongue is on the top of the palate when you pronounce it. And that's moved further in English into the African chamber, so k, sh, stuck in French now, and ch, chamber in English. Um, caput, chef, chief is the same example. 
The Franks occupied the north of France and the Visigoths, the south, you'll see in the map on screen there. And this led to a, a north-south linguistic divide based on the way people said yes. In the north, people said yes, saying will, which of course has become lui, and therefore that is the langue d'huile, the language of l'huile. And those in the south, the langue d'oc, where oc was the word for yes. Over time, the northern dialect carried the day, owing presumably to the influence of Paris, with the Oc languages of Occitan and Provençal still spoken deep south, becoming minority dialects. Individual words have fascinating histories. Uh, the language has undergone any number of foreign influences over the years. I'll give you one example. In the 16th century, Italian became very fashionable in France when the Italian princess Catherine de' Medici married Henri II. Her courtiers were noted for their extravagantly mannered behaviour, came all the rage. They would offer elaborate compliments to the ladies of the court, strewing flowers in front of them. And this entered French as fleurette from the Italian floretti, little flowers. The word is no longer used in French, it's, it's redundant, but the expression Conti fleuret is a fossil, it survives still, referring to flirtatious banter. As I say, the word uh, fleuret disappeared from French, apart from that one expression, but passed into English and became the word flirt. And in the past hundred years, the English word has been re-imported to French as flirt, uh, an example of franglais. Towards the end of the 16th century, the need was felt to put some sense of order into the vernacular language, spoken language of the French, which had chaotically assimilated so many different words from so many different sources. And grammarians regularized and codified the language. And the Académie Française was founded in 1635 as the official authority on French language and usage. As a result, 17th century French is largely recognizable to modern French readers and largely understandable to them, although the language continues to absorb foreign influences. English, already an influence in the 18th century with the huge popularity of Samuel Richardson's epistolary novels, Pamela and Clarissa, I don't imagine many of you have read those two, has become a major source of loanwords on the back of 20th century British and American culture, music, film, and of course now information technology. The trend continues. The French take great pride in the integrity, precision, and clarity of their language and seek to maintain them despite the constant assimilation of foreign loan words. I now turn to French literature, which is the only European literature to rival English in its unbroken quality from the Middle Ages to the present day. Its medieval literature is rich in epic poems, La Chanson de Roland, Tristan Isette, and courtly romances. François Villon, who was born in the early 15th century, wrote witty and poignant verse in the shadow of the gallows, literally on death row, he'd stabbed a priest in a bar brawl. He it was eventually pardoned. Uh, in the 16th century, there are Rabelais' tales of the giants Gargantua and Pantagruel, and the essays of Montaigne, and then a constellation of great poets, first amongst them Pierre Rossard. The French call the 17th century Le Grand Siècle, the Golden Age, with the playwrights Corneille, Molière and Racine much revered, and moralist moralist commentators on human behaviour like La Rochefoucauld and La Fontaine. For all these classical writers, their essential subject is man in general and the qualities which are common to us, as opposed, as opposed to the later romantic focus on the individual. The 18th century, of course, was the Enlightenment. The French call it the siècle des lumières, the century of lights. And there were so many famous philosophes or polymaths in France, Montesquieu, Diderot, Voltaire, Rousseau, and so on. And then the 19th century, rich in poets with Lamartine, Hugo, Baudelaire, Verlaine, and Rimbaud, and the big four novelists, Stendhal, Balzac, Flaubert, and Zola, not to mention Maupassant, the master of the short story. The list is endless, so let me offer you my three 
superheroes, all of whom have been significant influences on me. Coming up first is Montaigne. wonderfully named Michel Echem de Montaigne, or I shall call him Montaigne, 16th century. And I choose Montaigne for his humanity and his humility. He is the most humane of men, grounded and sane. He was not an academic, but very well read and a natural skeptic whose famous motto was qui sait, who knows, it's the old fashioned French spelling, it comes from Latin skire, to know. Initially a statesman, he later became mayor of Bordeaux, but he left public life at the age of 38 and retired to his property in the Dordogne, dedicating the second half of his life to what he called sa liberté, his freedom, sa tranquillité, his tranquility, et ses loisirs, his leisure. As such, he is a great inspiration to me. He sat up in the first floor room of his tower, surrounded by his books and his vineyards, and you can still see the beams scored by his own graffiti, mostly in Greek and Latin. Here he sat and wrote, reflecting upon his experience of life and the world. His subject, and this was novel for the time, was none other than himself. His writing is a personal rumination, full of examples and anecdote. His work is entitled Les Essais. He invented the word essay. It comes from the French word essayer, to try or to attempt, still used, of course, in French. And l'essai is, is the noun that comes from it. An attempt, a trial. He would set himself a subject and attempt a personal answer as a kind of test. His subjects ranged far and wide from the education of children, cannibalism and cowardice to the power of the imagination, idleness, conscience and many more besides. Montaigne did not seek immortality. Had he done so, he would have written in Latin, which was the established literary language of the time, but he chose to write in French, which was barely a literary language in his day. In his preface, he even self-deprecatingly suggests to the reader that he should not waste his time reading such frivolous material. He sought truth and self-knowledge through asking questions of himself. He was not a man given to generalisation. He liked to quote the exceptional to underline the variety and unpredictability of human experience. Just one example, he was amused, for example, to think that a philosopher, for all his wisdom and knowledge, would be terrified if suspended from the towers of Notre Dame in a transparent wire cage, despite the fact that his reason would tell him he was not going to fall. His down-to-earth common sense has always appealed to me. Of monarchs, he writes, with the most wonderful bathos, and here I quote in the 16th century spellings, et au plus élevé trône du monde, even on the highest or most exalted throne in the world, si ne sommes assis que sous notre cul. We are only sitting on our ass. In the 16th century, death was always a close companion. Montaigne lived through the violent religious wars that raged between Catholics and Protestants, and his own life was often in danger. There were also repeated outbreaks of plague. He suffered from chronic pain caused by kidney stones, which he describes graphically, la gravelle in French, and endured grievous personal loss, in particular the death of his great friend Etienne de la Boissie, a sort of bromance, the love of his life, and the loss of four of his five daughters before they were three months old. In spite of all this, he remained determined to extract from life maximum enjoyment. Living well was his watchword. And I rather like this quotation, c'est une absolue perfection. It is absolute perfection. Et comme divine, as it were divine, de savoir jouir loyalement de son être, to know how properly or honestly to enjoy one's life. And rather than being defined by death, he put it in its place. Je veux que la mort me trouve plantant mes choux. 
I want death to find me while I'm planting my cabbages. Mais nonchalant d'elle, but not worried about death at all. Et encore plus de mon jardin, imparfait, and even less worried about my imperfect garden. In my fantasy dinner party, Michel de Montaigne will be the first guest name on my list. Superhero number two, François-Marie Arouet, known as Voltaire, who bestrode the 18th century. And I choose him for his towering intellect and his courage, physical and moral. His life across the 18th century, he was a major figure in that most optimistic of times, the Enlightenment, when there was the genuine belief that by virtue of the inevitable increase in knowledge and scientific progress, man would one day unlock the mysteries of life and the universe. It was a time of extraordinary polymaths such as Goethe, Rousseau, Diderot, Locke and Hume, an international movement, many of whom contributed to the Encyclopédie, Encyclopédie, the Encyclopédia, whose aim was to represent, represent the sum of human knowledge. Drying up, excuse me. Voltaire was the great champion of free speech. He believed in God or a supreme being, but not in the established church. He was tolerant of religious belief while reserving the right to argue strenuously against it and to satirize it. And he denounced religious fanaticism of all stripes. We might imagine what he would have made of the Charlie Hebdo massacre, which is being tried at the moment in Paris. A famous quotation of his is, La tolérance n'a jamais excité de guerre civile. Tolerance has never provoked a civil war. L'intolérance a couvert la terre de carnage. Intolerance has spread carnage throughout the world. Were he alive today, Voltaire, I suspect, would rail against the newly asserted right not to be offended. He would have spoken out against the cancel culture and the current fashion among our universities for no platforming individuals with supposedly unacceptable views. He certainly had the courage of his convictions. He was beaten up by hard thugs as a young man after lampooning a Parisian notable. He was twice imprisoned in the Bastille, once spending months in a windowless cell with 10 foot thick walls, where, as he later wrote, he was never incommoded by the sun. For two and a half years, he chose exile in England and lived initially in Wandsworth on the site of the present police station, as it happens. On his return to France, he wrote admiring essays on British government, literature, religion and science, and caused a huge scandal. Published without the approval of the royal censor, the essays lauded British constitutional monarchy as more developed and more respectful of human rights than its French counterpart, particularly regarding religious tolerance. The book was publicly burnt and banned, and Voltaire was again forced to flee Paris. He became an outspoken critic of all hypocrisies, particularly religious bigotry. Towards the end of his life, by now a celebrity, he championed unjustly persecuted individuals, most famously Jean Callas, a Huguenot merchant who had been tortured to death in 1763 on trumped up charges that he had murdered his eldest son for wanting to convert to Catholicism. His possessions were confiscated and his two daughters forced into Catholic convents. Voltaire campaigned against this outrage and managed to overturn the conviction in 1765. His literary output was huge. He wrote history, tragedy, and his correspondence was voluminous. But the work for which he's now principally remembered, his Contes Philosophiques, Philosophic Tales, and in particular, of course, Candide, he wrote in later life and considered them bagatelles. He would be surprised now to know that Candide is in most people's top 10 of the greatest works of fiction ever written. Candide satirizes the philosophical theories of the distinguished mathematician Leibniz, caricatured as Professor Pangloss, who parrots tout est pour le mieux dans le meilleur des mondes possibles, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. <clears throat> His pupil, 
the unworldly and naive young Condit finds this optimism increasingly difficult to square with the implausible succession of disasters which befall him. At the end, Condi decides the best thing for him is to renounce his aspiration to perfection, accept relative happiness, and get on with digging his garden. Il faut cultiver notre jardin, which to me is a pretty workable philosophy of life. And finally, my third superhero is Albert Camus. I rather like this. Uh, most pictures of Camus have him with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and looking rather glum. Here he shows a levity which I don't normally associate with him. And I choose Camus for his, for want of a better term, Weltanschauung, his take on the world, his view of the world, and how we might achieve at least relative happiness. Camus was a pied noir, that is a Blackfoot literary, that is a Frenchman born in Algeria, and a sensuous appreciation of the Mediterranean sun suffuses much of his writing. He's often compared uh, unfavourably to Sartre, but his particular brand of humanist thinking has always appealed more to me. He was a big influence on me as a late teenager, and still today he seems to me to offer a plausible explanation of our world and a way of living. Camus was acutely aware of the paradox that man is intelligent, has the ability to reason, to ask questions, to think logically, and yet is unable to answer the biggest metaphysical questions of all. What is the meaning of life? Why do we suffer? Why do we die? For him, the world we find ourselves in is unreasonable, and what he called the absurd lies in the confrontation of this irrationality with the unrelenting desire for understanding which lies deep within us all. God, if he exists, has turned his back on the world. For him, man is innocent, uh, for Camus, man is innocent, and yet he finds himself sentenced to death. Camus rejects the notion of original sin. So how can we find some positive meaning in life defined as it is by our mortality? Well, we can, like Meursault in L'Etranger, The Outsider, one of Camus' works, enjoy human interaction, <clears throat> intimacy, physical pleasures like drying our hands on a clean, crisp towel, swimming in the sea, basking in the sun. But Meursault is never a role model for me. My favourite work is La Peste, The Plague. I studied it for A-level, with Mr Wright, of course, and I reread it during lockdown. It tells of a fictional outbreak of plague in Oran and the Algerian coast in the 1940s, but it speaks uncannily to our present predicament of quarantine, separation and random death. The principal character and narrator is a doctor called Rieu, who is in the front line caring for his fellow humans. He wages an unrelenting struggle on behalf of the sick and is involved in the hunt for a serum. Any life he saves, he knows only too well, can only ever be a temporary victory. Death will always triumph in the end. But positive values are asserted. <clears throat> in particular, the solidarity and common humanity which unite Rieu and his friends and colleagues who, like resistance fighters, join the battle against the plague. In the final paragraph of the novel, we are warned that the plague, which in the widest sense symbolises evil in the world, never dies and never disappears. But there is a note of optimism. Il y a dans les hommes plus de choses à admirer que de choses à mépriser. There are in men more things to admire than to despise. <clears throat> this has been my experience of life. In retirement, I've had plenty of time to ponder the meaning of life and the notion of happiness. When people ask me what I do these days since I left Latimer, I say that I'm actively engaged in the pursuit of leisure and pleasure. Like Montaigne, I'm motivated by the maximization of joy and pleasure and the minimization of pain and sorrow. After a brush with cancer three years ago, I more than ever relish the blessing of good health of physical well-being, of feeling alive. Above all, I take immense pleasure in seeing our children and grandchildren live their lives, of spending time with them, 
I'm happy, by the way, to tell you they now love coming to France and spending time in the company of good friends or curled up with a congenial book. There is, I suppose, in most of us, an uncertainty about what the future holds, an unspoken sense of foreboding. Can't school my thing. Yeah. At times, down in the longer dock, as I float in the pool under the Mediterranean sun, gazing at the parasol pines as they wave in the breeze against a luminous blue sky, with the imminent prospect of a glass of chilled rosé, I find myself buoyed by Camus' expression of anxious contentment as he basked in the heat of the Algerian sun. Il n'y a pas de honte à préférer le bonheur. There is no shame in preferring happiness. Sante. Peter, thank you so much. That was, that was a really moving uh, cultural, linguistic and personal tour of, of France. I thought that was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, now, let's, let's open this up. Who would like to ask uh, Peter a question? Peter and I are monitoring this, aren't we? Um, I'd like to think I am, but I'm leaving it to you, Charles. <laughs> well, maybe that's just me. Yes, that was, that was the royal we you were using. Yes, quite. So what um, I've got, I've got one um, sent earlier, uh, which, which is, what, why did you choose the area that you've got your, your home that you spend three months a year? What, yeah. what was it um, about that area? Well, the, the banal answer really is climate. Um, <clears throat> in an earlier existence, in the early 90s, we for three years owned a little house in Normandy, which was great fun and obviously much more accessible from Kent, where we lived at the time. Uh, we had to sell that. <clears throat> that was the price of ambition to raise money to buy a house in Bath. Uh, but it was always our plan to try and get a house in the south of France um, because of the Mediterranean climate, which is as good a climate as I know in the world. California, I think, might come close. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you look at the, the southern quarter of France, then you've got Provence, of course, which is marvellous. But one, it's extremely expensive and also very, very crowded in the summer months. The long dock is, in relative terms, undiscovered, has the same climate, slightly less violent weather, and endless space. And um, you're surrounded by nothing but vineyards. I think well, that's probably well, yeah, that's, that'll do the best it. answer I can give you. <laughs> um, we've got one from Nick Baxter. Nick, would you like to unmute yourself and, and, um, and read out what you've, you've written in chat? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, can everyone read it themselves? I'm happy to. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see anything, so read it, Nick. Yeah, sure. I've, what? Oh, you can't see? So I was just wondering if you, how, still up, how up on the language you are at the moment, because I'm, I'm curious to know how they're dealing with non-gendered pronouns. <laughs> so, Sorry, I, I missed the end. How up am I on the language? And the last bit was... I'm just going to put a, a microphone in. Hold on. Non-gendered pronouns. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, okay. So I was wondering if you knew, if you're, if you're a kind of current visitor, how they're managing to deal with um, this kind of they business. So as in, when your baby is time for a follow-on milk, they should move on to our product. Is well, of course, uh, the, the possessive adjectives in French um, uh, are used according to the gender of the noun you're, that they're qualifying. So, uh, sans sassé, for example. But what uh, about Louis la E? Uh, yeah, so that kind of avoids the problem, I think, in, in many ways. So I, I'm, I have to say, Nick, I'm blissfully unaware of these things. But there's, there's him... The the channel, frankly. But him, her, them, for example. They... Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, sorry, I, 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 I just thought you involved. might know. Okay, sorry, not to... No, no, I didn't mean to pose you a curveball there. Not to twist about <laughs> it, but I passed blissfully above it. Marvellous. Okay, great, great talk, by the way. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, has anyone got any more questions? They can put David, in the David chat. Grant has got his hand up. I, uh, that could be a tricky question. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, yes, of course. He's raised his hand, apparently. I'm not quite Jamie, sure. Jamie, you're you know, on. It took, it, took, it took all my technical ability to raise my hand, Peter. So I, I, I thank you for, uh, for spotting it. Um, spectacular. I mean, just couldn't, could way beyond even my expectations, which were high since you taught me <laughs> at Latimer. Um, I, I'm sad you didn't mention Britannicus, but um, we'll let that go. 
I, I just tell that story I, if you like. Uh, well, tell that story, but then also tell me why, if uh, Montaigne is your hero, have you not written this all down? Do you need to be put in a tower? Or I mean, it, it seems to me this would be wonderful as a as a memoirs, and I, I just I think I, I don't know. You go from Jean Drian, who who we all teased you know, um, <laughs> horribly at school with his ridiculous cigarette. Uh, I, I can't believe he was in a backing group for Edith Piaf. Yes, he toured Canada with Compagnon de la Chanson. <laughs> the, uh, for, for those who are wondering why Jamie is mentioning Britannicus, um, a, a, a tragedy by Racine, uh, the advice I used to give to Oxbridge candidates was, was never to try and bluff an interview and never to name drop and never mention a play that you haven't read. I'm not sure in your case, Jay, whether we'd actually read Britannicus or not. I think, no, this is embarrassing. But Jamie is <laughs> kindly one of two people. The other is my daughter, Tiffany, I think is listening today who both of them completely ignored my advice not to blag an interview at Oxford. They both dropped the thing that they'd read Britannicus by Hasid, which was pretty recherche, you know, that, wow. Uh, you can see the Oxford Don being impressed by that. And luckily there weren't many follow-up questions. Uh, <laughs> Tiff had, I think, read the synopsis, so you probably had as well. This is probably not to be listened to by current Latimer students. It was a Coles Notes version of this. But... <laughs> Great to see you, Jamie. Um, but Matthew, Matthew Shaw, do you want to, to read yours out, Matthew? Sure. Hi, Peter. Long time no see. Hello, Matthew. Lovely to see you. <laughs> really lovely to see you. Um, one thing I was interested in is, uh, I don't know the, if this would have been your experience as well, but your thoughts on, going back to education, Oxford's approach to French literature over French language um mm. and whether that that is something you had noticed whilst well, there was I, I certainly that noticed it and, and i kind of alluded to it in the sense that when i left oxford i couldn't really engage in everyday conversation but i could i could dazzle french people by, mm -hmm. by trotting out a few alexandrines you know rhyming 17th century verse um i have to say and this probably says more about me i i love the oxford course i i loved french literature Mm -hmm. But I am quite odd. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, at the time, one, they discouraged the year abroad. They didn't think that was part of the basic, although you had to have a high um, appreciation of language. If I tell you that the, the French viva I was given uh, involved me reading out a passage of Flaubert and then answering questions on Flaubert, it wasn't a kind of a general conversation. So it was a man, it was literary exegesis. Um, and they expect you just to I pick up the language via osmosis, I think, or by wide reading in French. So it is weird, but I, I funnily enough, I was rather fond of it. And I think it was, a, I do feel without being pompous, I hope that it was a, it was a good, useful intellectual training. Absolutely. Yeah. But, um, Oxford doesn't do practical things, although I'm amused now it's the number one university because it's hoping to... Uh, find a vaccine for COVID and, and, and all power to its elbow. I, but I, I also know that that's the reason Oxford is the number one university called the Sunday Times, whereas Cambridge is the leading university in 32 subjects as against five by Oxford. <laughs> now, I, I was puzzled by the, the analysis there. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Great to see you, Matthew. Good Thank you, me. Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Marianne, would you like to, to give your question? Marianne, it's a great Marianne, song. Marianne, Marianne being shy. <laughs> very discreet. She's very discreet. Uh, Marianne, I'm going to read it for you. Um, to what extent is Camus an existentialist? He is, well, essentially he is. <laughs> <laughs> a pithy, a pithy but existentialism comes in all sorts of different uh, shades and colours. Sartre and Camus distanced themselves. They fell out a little bit, partly because their war record um, but also there were earlier Christian existentialists, um, Kierkegaard, for example. So the existentialism is, 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 a, is, a, is a rather loose term, but um, I, I see the existentialism as a, as, a, as a group of pretty cool people at the end of the Second World War and the 50s who had some interesting thoughts about life and some which aren't very interesting at all, like the gratuitous act, for example, and whether it's possible to actually do something which is completely gratuitous, not motivated by 
uh, personal interest. I became less interested in that kind of stuff. Good, good, thank you. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Labors, would you like to unmute yeah. yourself? I think it's, I think it's Shall I see Rupert Harding is also wanting okay. to ask a, a general question, Peter. How hello, do we, Jeff. hello, Jeff. Hi, Peter. How do we reverse the uh, decline in take up of study of foreign languages in education? Ah. Well, um, that's a big question, which I, 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 I really. Um, current trends with the, the centrality, the increasing centrality of English make it, I suspect, ever harder to encourage English youths to study French, or uh, one appeals to their the sense of paying a courtesy towards, towards the unknown, encourage them to appreciate difference and so on. But English has become a kind of useful, is becoming a kind of universal language. So I do fear a greater centralization. And they are kind of irresistible forces in the same way that French, if you like, picking up from what I said earlier, is overrunning all of these local dialects. So where I am in, in the Languedoc, there are people, older generations, that still speak Occitan. And uh, if you go into Béziers, there are two signposts, Béziers in French and Béziers, which is the Occitan. But over time, you know the Occitan is going to fade away. And um, I, I think it's pretty irresistible, sadly. Um, and you said Rupert, did Rupert have his hand up? He did. Oh, Rupert, yeah. are you there? Peter, uh, Rupert Harding, I, I just want to say, um, well, thank you very much for a very entertaining hour. I don't have any specific questions for you, but I, I do have to say it does rather take me back to 1973 in a rather uh, alarming sort of way. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's more alarming for you or for me, Rupert. <laughs> but um, I did mention Voltaire, and I, I did think uh, as I, when I saw your face come up that the very first set book I taught was Zadig, you remember? I hope you remember, which is one of uh, Voltaire's philosophic tales, which I enjoyed at the time. Well, I, I enjoyed it greatly at the time as well. And it, uh, there's a, another very alarming moment when you see a shop in London called Zadig et Voltaire. Yes. <laughs> you see, you wonder how many people actually know why it's called that. Well, I don't know, but it's even more alarming if you go in and buy something because of the outrageous prices. <laughs> as my daughter found out uh, when we were in Paris a few years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. Very entertaining. Wonderful to see you, Rupert. I, I'm having a flashback here. <laughs> I have my back to the 70s. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, a, a quick one from, I'll, I'll read this one out. Ron yeah. says, wonderful expression of your fascination with France and the French. Um, and then he says something in French, which I'm not going to attempt. Um, okay. And, and Liana, do, does Liana want to, to say her... Her question? Good yes, I can. Hi. Hello, hey, um, oh wow. Hello. hello. <laughs> How are you? Hey. Thank you for the talk. It's lovely to hear you speak again, especially to recite some poems that I remember you teaching us some time ago. Oh, I do. Um, <laughs> it moved me to tears. I was like, you say <laughs> My question was around, have you, as you've spent more time living in France, are there any, I'm sure there are cultural quirks that have either delighted or, or you found challenging. Um, as you've gotten to know the French and living in France better, I wondered if you have any uh, of those. Well, yes, and, and many, as I'm fascinated by the, the, the similarities as well as differences, the area where we are, we've been there, we bought in 2010, I, we retired in 2012, so now we've been going down more or less, you know, May to September in this, this long, hot summers, really. Mm. And, and it's been funny, it's actually longer was not an area of France I knew particularly well, so I chose it for its climate. And we met so many nice people down there, but it's even for me who can speak French and tries quite hard to relate to the locals, it's quite hard to really get to know local French people. The mm. I, I play tennis and a club with French guys and they come from Paris, from Charente, from all over Dieppe. Um, there's just one local Magalassian there who has a very colorful accent and, and vocabulary to match, by the way, which I won't quote here. Um, the, the thing that even the, those French guys say about the locals, they're very rude about the locals, the méridionaux. And they say that, you know, they're, they're basically, they're lazy. They say this is, well, they're lazy and they're not very hospitable. Now that's not quite been my experience, but it's hard to get inside their homes. So, you know, in London, we go 
we, 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 we have dinner parties and meet friends in homes. Down there, we have got into three or four homes over the, over the years, but what they say down there is, um, ils vous ouvrent les bras, they open their arms to you, so superficial friend, mais ils ne les referment pas, that they don't close them behind you. And it, it, there's that little sense that they're, slight, they, they're, they're very set in their ways. Um, on the other hand, they're extraordinarily welcoming. I mean, we bring a lot of, I mean, the Brits and other foreigners bring a lot of commerce and trade and, and pay money for their houses. So it's, it's a mixed picture, but it's endlessly fascinating. And we, Andrew and I play bull in the local village uh, twice a week, and that you know, that's a whole vocabulary comes with that. Pointer and tirer, and uh, uh, oh yeah, I won't go on. But it, you know, it's a, it's a, that's another linguistic avenue to follow. So that's many things. Thank you. Can can we quickly, Alvin? Are you out there, Alvin Jackson? Good heavens! Another ghost from my past. Well, I, yeah, I probably look a bit ghostly because the lighting's a bit <laughs> rubbish in my, um, in my living room, isn't it? But, Alvin, uh, lower 5T, 1974. I'm, I'm normally better, the, better lit than this. So, well, you, <laughs> you've reminded me of so many happy memories, Peter, but you've also sort of made me very sad that I'm actually not in France, where I probably would be at this time of year. Uh -huh. um, but actually, they're, they're, they're replaying um, Floyd on France on BBC iPlayer from the 80s, oh. if, any, if any, any of you want to sort of remind yourself of the great Keith Floyd and um, his <laughs> travels in France, which- um, we've, just, we've just come back from two months in France, so I don't really rub yeah. We've just been through the quarantine process. Which invariably, oh, well, bless you, but um, invariably involved um, a few glasses of wine, to say sans say weird. Um, Peter, I was, I mean, I've, I've sort of picked up French literature again in recent years, so I've <laughs> sort of been drawn to some of the classics. Yeah. I'm not really started. I haven't tried to reread Racine or um, Voltaire or Molière. Yeah, that would be of, odd if you did. <laughs> yeah, but I'm halfway through um, a Maupassant novel, um, which ah. is fun. So Une Vie, and um, but it's yeah, still right. going. Which and see the film. Fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but I was going to ask you. You sort of stopped your um, here at the tour of the greats with um, Camus, who died in 1960, yeah. when some of the people on this call were probably born, um, myself yeah. included. Yeah. What's your view of um, literature in France since the existentialists? Well, I'm learning it because uh, the Oxford course ended officially in 1939. So anything post-war, I've, I've, you know, I didn't study at university. And so uh, one of the things I've been doing in retirement has been one, one of my missions is to discover more contemporary French mm. writing. So, for example, I really enjoy the novels of a guy called Pierre Le Maître. I just read a, um, a trilogy of his. Um, well, the first one is called Au Voir Lao, and uh, it's about a scam based on truth, apparently, at the end of the First World War, when huge amounts of money were made by unscrupulous people burying all the corpses, you can imagine all the dead people at the end of World War. Um, they, um, th there was a, a financial scam on this, and um, made worse by the, the people who got the contract, cheapskating it, and having coffins only four foot length and so they well are you, I'll, I'll allow you to use your imagination what happened with these, <laughs> these poor men <laughs> anyway that's a, that's a sense of the rather black humor that Pierre Lemaitre so he's one writer I like Annie Arnaud another um uh, I've got a list here Leila Slimani is another writer I'm enjoying at the moment but uh, I'm not an expert on contemporary French literature it's a it's a it's a voyage of discovery me it's fun I'm, I'm enjoying it mm. it's a lovely book called um, Idis, I -D -I -S -S. check it out, by Robert Badinter. He was a, um, he was a government minister. It's about his grandmother. It's a, it's a story, a story of uh, um, the, the Jewish diaspora and his grandmother and relatives who, who died in the Holocaust, but it's a very moving little tale. And maybe, maybe, um, maybe Sean and or Peter, after this, you need to sort of send out a reading list for us all. So. <laughs> Very I'm not good. parking any essays you write, that's for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't guarantee you to deliver the essay on time, Peter. But. <laughs> <laughs> Some things have never changed, darling. <laughs> <laughs> thank, there's, there's you. Love, a, thank you. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a great question. There's a lovely message from Nigel saying, dazzled by your brilliance, I uh, wish I'd gone to Latimer, which, uh, frankly, I, I agree with wholeheartedly. But Nigel's a, a, one of my old friends who was a brilliant French teacher at Seven Oaks with me, and we see each other a lot. 
and we go to Paris every year in February together oh, really? with, yeah. with our respective wives and have a, a riotous time. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, if that, I think that's probably it on the questions. Time is I, up, I, is it? Yeah. I think it was. And so really just to say thank you so much again to Peter and thank you to, to, to you, our audience, for such great questions. And if you'd like to join us for more of these virtually speaking talks, you'll see a link to our forthcoming events page in the chat facility. If you have a look at that now, we're still uploading a number of new events for the autumn term, which you can register for. Um, on our website via this link, you'll see a link to the donations page and a link to the video library, which I mentioned earlier, where you can catch up on, on all the talks we recorded over the summer. So I think that's the end of the evening. Um, and, and just thank you all for joining us. And, and thank you so much for Peter, again, for sharing such an inspiring talk with us. It's a real uh, pleasure. And, Lovely to reconnect with people. It's a wonderful seeing some of those faces there. Do keep in touch with me. It's a uh, <laughs> Fantastic. We my also have my dotage. <laughs> and Sean, thank you for nursing me through the evening. And to Lynn and Joe, who I know are loitering in the background somewhere. Very kind of you. No, that, that, that was a great evening. I think I think we were all, if we weren't francophiles before, we certainly are now. And yeah, um, well, I must I must find out what, where you live in France. Um, so yes, hope hope we see you all again uh, very soon for one of our, our next virtually speaking. Okay. Thank you. Good night. The final Good night. cheers. Goodbye. Okay.